Welcome back, everyone. For those of you that have been in breakout rooms, um, this is our penultimate session. And I'm going to ask you to take your seats. And I will introduce Dr. Mino, who is in the building. Okay. Elvis is in the building. I feel like my job is complete. <laughs> so, uh, Emmanuel Mignot then, he's the Craig Reynolds Professor of Sleep Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. And he's the director of the Stanford Center for Narcolepsy. Dr. Mignot is recognized as having discovered the cause of narcolepsy. Born in Paris, he received his MD and PhD there and then practiced medicine and psychiatry also in France for several years before serving as a visiting scholar at the Stanford Sleep Disorders Clinic and Research Center. He then joined as faculty and director of the Center of Narcolepsy in 1993 and he was named professor of psychiatry in 2001. Dr. Mignot received, has received numerous awards for his work, including, and most recently, the 2023 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences. He is a member of both the National Academies of Sciences and Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Mignot. First, I want to thank uh, you so much for being here and for listening to my talk, and thank you for inviting me. Now I'm going to ask you to do the introduction every time, because it's so much better with an English accent, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> I did cut yours down. Um, I think I had three pages printed on you, but I actually almost just said, here's a manual. But anyway. <laughs> anyway. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, idiopathic hypersomnia and its cousins. The reason uh, I, I, I mention its cousins because I think this concept of idiopathic hypersomnia is changing. And you know what is hypersomnia is not completely clear. So the first question I will go through before discussing what should be done in the future is what is really idiopathic hypersomnia? So I guess this will work. We'll see. OK. So I have many conflict of interest but uh, because I work with everyone that's trying to you know, develop drugs for narcolepsy and hypersomnia. So the good thing is since I have conflict of interest with everybody, I'm less conflicted. <laughs> but uh, still, uh, you have to, to know that. So the first question I wanted to go through is what is idiopathic hypersomnia? Where does it come from? Because I think often you know, we forget about our history, but history is very important. It's really... Uh, our roots, and often it gives us a, a little bit of a better idea of what people were thinking initially. So, you know, the, coin, the, the term idiopathic hypersomnia really started in the Czech Republic uh, when it was still communist uh, by Bederik Ross, who, by the way, was a very incredible man, which I never met, unfortunately, but he passed away. He resisted the occupation by the communist regime, and he had a lot of difficulties because of that. Uh, and he really defined uh, idiopathic hypersomnia, uh, as I will explain, uh, with a series of symptoms that, that corresponded to something different from narcolepsy. Because, you know, you had narcolepsy with cataplexy and REM sleep abnormality, and the idea was maybe idiopathic hypersomnia would be something more that has to do with non-REM sleep, you know, being more like needing more non-REM sleep as opposed to REM sleep for narcolepsy. Then in the 1980s, uh, you know, Dr. Honda which, uh, in Japan also tried to differentiate different types of hypersomnia. And for him, he called uh, monosymptomatic, there were narcolepsy with cataplexy, and then monosymptomatic narcolepsy, and then essential hypersomnia. And then in the 1990s, the MSLT uh, started to be developed to diagnose narcolepsy type 1, narcolepsy with cataplexy. It was really designed to, div to uh, diagnose patients with narcolepsy type 1, so people who have narcolepsy cataplexy, to really verify that they had the diagnosis in an objective way. But then it started to be applied to everybody else that complained of sleepiness, and then they started to define these disorders based on the result of the test, narcolepsy type 2, when you are positive for the MSLT, but you don't have cataplexy, and idiopathic hypersomnia, when you fall asleep quickly, but you don't have cataplexy and you don't go into REM sleep. Uh, 
and really, uh, where are we now? And then in parallel with this, there was this odd condition called periodic hypersomnia, or Klein-Nevin syndrome, who was, who was first described in 1925 uh, by Klein and then Levin, uh, which I will talk a little bit about it, which is like, unlike the other condition, was something that fluctuated. So people would be very tired and very sleepy and needing a lot of sleep, a little bit like idiopathic hypersomnia, but more extreme, but only during periods of time, and then get completely cured, and then it would restart by episodes. So I will discuss a little bit about all these different conditions. So again, the first uh, definition of idiopathic hypersomnia come from Bederich Ross, who really had this idea that, again, people had already, oh, it's, talk, it's moving spontaneously, uh, had this idea that you had narcolepsy, people had discovered in the 50 that narcolepsy were going very quickly into REM sleep. So there was this idea that indeed you have narcolepsy type one, which is a REM sleep problem, you know, like people have this hallucination, this dreaming, and that was one type of problem with sleep. And then people had discovered there were non-REM sleep, which is like stage three, four, or two. And then the idea is idiopathic hypersomnia, where people, who instead of needing more REM sleep, needed more non-REM sleep. And the idea is that they would be really difficult to awaken, be in sleep, uh, you know, very deep sleep, a little bit like a child, you know, when they have a lot of slow wave sleep and would sleep long period of time uh, and that they had difficulty waking up. It was much more like people were kind of sleep deprived and needed more sleep, but felt like they were always sleep deprived. And then he differentiated, you know, a little bit this uh, monosymptomatic hypersomnia where people will sleep a long time during the day and the night, and then some other polysymptomatic idiopathic hypersomnia where they were also the same, plus were a little confused and, and difficult to wake up, you know, having like a lot of sleep inertia. And then he mentioned this, which is not very fashionable, idea of neurotic hypersomnia, which has, was more like hypersomnia due to a psychiatric disorder, which is basically people who you, you know, would be tired all the time, but when you look at their sleep, it didn't seem to be very abnormal. Uh, and he mentioned also that it was frequently familial, that maybe there were genetic component, and really, uh, the MSLT was not considered important at the time. Nobody was doing the MSLT, but they were doing the sleep studies, and what they wanted to see in the sleep studies is people who had a lot of slow wave sleep, you know, needed a lot of sleep that's not REM sleep. Uh, and a little bit later, you know, Dr. Billiard in France, in Montpellier, really started to discuss the fact that sometimes it's a little bit difficult to differentiate idiopathic hypersomnia from some form of depression that need a lot of sleep. And I think, you know, it's, uh, it's a little bit academic. It's always a problem because, you know, depression or psychiatric disorders, they also come from the brain. It's not like, you know, you can separate, you know, psychiatric and neurologic. You know, the only reason psychiatric and neurology has been separated is because of a couple of people in the 1800s, uh, at the end of the 19th century, one guy that was called Babensky, that kind of was doing all these exams in people and then trying to see if one of the nerves were not working. And if he found an objective finding, he would say, ah, this is a, a neurological disorder. And if he didn't find anything, he said, ah, this is a psychiatric disorder. But the truth is, of the matter is the more you look, the more you might be able to find abnormalities and then things will disappear. If we apply this definition, we maybe one day we'll be able to analyze the entire brain and then nothing else will be psychiatric. Um, because, of, of course, everything originates in the brain. So in Japan, they had a slightly different view. The Japanese were very focused on cataplexy, so they definitely defined this narcolepsy with cataplexy very well. In fact, there was this professor called Honda who was insisting that cataplexy was the most specific symptom, was the most important for narcolepsy, which is still true to date. But then he was seeing that there were some other patients that looked like narcolepsy in the sense that in narcoleptics, it's not like they sleep too much. It's more like they cannot stay awake. So they will wake up and then they will have to nap regularly, but their nap would feel refreshing, which is not the case at all in idiopathic hypersomnia. The classical picture of idiopathic hypersomnia, people cannot nap, they have trouble waking up. Again, they have a lot of this non-REM sleep. And you know, during non-REM sleep, you have sleepwalking, you have which is really confusional arousal. So it's more like people who have trouble being awake and in non-REM sleep. 
And he, was he said that there were probably a gradient of people who had more like narcolepsy type 1, but with refreshing naps, and were still a little bit the same as the narcoleptic. Uh, and then there were some uh, uh, people who were more on the idiopathic hypersomnia, more non-REM sleep. But you see, the idea at the time was to differentiate REM sleep hypersomnia and non-REM sleep hypersomnia. That was the whole idea. And non-REM sleep hypersomnia would be idiopathic hypersomnia, and REM sleep hypersomnia would be narcolepsy. The problem is that then people started to say, oh, if that's the case, by the way, interestingly, which is something that I want to point out, because this is coming now, we know that uh, when you have narcolepsy with cataplexy, uh, you usually never improve. I mean, if you don't get treated, you, you have the disorder for life. And here, you just follow up how people like, uh, felt like 10 years after uh, you know, having um, developed a disorder, and he showed that only like 10%, you know, feel felt better when they had narcolepsy type 1. So narcolepsy type 1 is definitely a permanent disease, whereas for idiopathic, what he called essential hypersomnia syndrome, so this mix between narcolepsy without cataplexy and idiopathic hypersomnia, you know, about half would improve. So again, that's something that I always mention to people with idiopathic hypersomnia. Even so, I really want to treat you very actively. I just want to make sure that you know that there are cases that get better with time. And I think that's very important for children or young adults so that you don't put them a sticker that is going to live all their life because maybe at some point they may be able to stop medication and feel better. So uh, in addition to this concept, there were also this, this concept of recurrent hypersomnia that came from Klein and Levin with this idea that you had these people who were completely normal, and then suddenly they would become extremely sleepy for two or three weeks, and they will sleep enormously, like 20 hours or 24 hours. And even when they were awake, they were not normal. They were totally confused. Like, it's almost they could never completely wake up. They were in the days, you know, they would... And, and even sometimes their brain was, was disconnected so that they would have uh, be illogical or, or maybe sometimes be disinhibited. For example, eat some very strange food in, in a very primitive way or even have sexual disinhibition. You know, like really like the cortex was disconnected. They were almost like half in a state of half dream, which they say frequently that they say that they feel they are in a bubble, that the, the world is kind of uh, feeling different. But what was uh, very unusual is that this would go on for two or three weeks, and then boom, they will be completely normal after, and then it would, it would relapse uh, from time to time, very unpredictably. So they call this periodic or recurrent hypersomnia, and we call this uh, Klein-Levin syndrome. And it, it's definitely a special entity because, uh, you know, these people have this. They are usually adolescent men, uh, and then usually when you wait, it gets better with time. Uh, so after 10 years or 12 years, often the, the episode becomes less intense, and then people usually get cured of their hypersomnia. And it's responsive to lithium, which suggests that maybe some overlap with some of this psychiatric uh, uh, diagnosis. Um, so again, besides this classification that was more clinical, what happened is the MSLT. So the MSLT was invented really to diagnose narcolepsy, cataplexy, narcolepsy type 1. And it's a good test for it. It's 95% positive in narcolepsy and 95% and negative in controls. So it's a very good test. It has only 4 or 5% false positive. Uh, and uh, false negative, so it's, it's really a good test for narcolepsy with cataplexy. The problem is we created a condition based, instead of basing it on the symptom of patients, we based it on the test. So we knew that narcolepsy cataplexy was good at diagnosing type 1 narcolepsy, and we say, oh, now we are going to use it for everybody else that's tired, and if they have REM sleep, we'll call them narcolepsy type 2, and then if they don't have REM sleep, we'll call them idiopathic hypersomnia and because it would be non-REM versus REM. So the problem is nobody had done his homework, and in fact, it means nothing. Basically, you can have an MSLT with two saw REM one day in a patient with narcolepsy without cataplexy. If you repeat it three months later, it looks like idiopathic hypersomnia. Or you get idiopathic hypersomnia, you repeat it three months later, it becomes narcolepsy without cataplexy. So practically now, we really realize, probably too late, that, that this test doesn't mean anything. 
you know, it's much more important to focus on the symptoms of the patient than on the test. So for me, the test, the only interest of the test is the insurance. You know, unfortunately, insurance don't always consider uh, narcolepsy without cataplexy or idiopathic hypersomnia uh, the same way. Some of this uh, insurance will pay better for medication when you have an MSLT with multiple SOREM than when you have an MSLT without SOREM. But truly and honestly, it's completely idiotic. It doesn't mean anything. So, so you just have to convince... <laughs> <laughs> You just have to convince the insurance because the MSLT is not a good test to really predict what people really experience when they have idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy without cataplexy. So I'm just hoping that uh, this, this artificial uh, thing will disappear, but we don't know when it will happen. So the first kind of stroke against the MSLT was published quite a while ago, you see, in 1996, where people are trying to see if people have an MSLT with SOREM or an MSLT without SOREM, does it correlate with people having more difficulty waking up or having naps that are not refreshing? Does it correlate with this idea of non-REM hypersomnia and REM hypersomnia of Bederick Ross and, and Dr. Honda? And what they found is absolutely not. They found that first there were a lot of false positives. They were false positive, but that we knew that about 5% of cases had a positive MSLT, but uh, but sometimes it was just by chance. Uh, and we found that also in the general population. If, if, you, if you take people out of the street and you get them an MSLT, about 4% are going to have SOREM and look like a narcolepsy type 1. So 4% is not a big deal when you have a real narcoleptic that has cataplexy and everything because it's 96% of the time it's positive, so that's okay. Uh, and and it's, it's a good test. But then when you apply it to the general population, it's not good. Uh, so, um, and one of the things that was found is the SOREM during the MSLT are confounded by a few things. So for example, if you have shift work, the circadian clock regulates REM sleep very strongly. So in the morning hours, you have a lot of REM sleep naturally. So if, your circuit, if you come from uh, another country and you do the MSLT during the day, it's very likely that you have, will have REM sleep because your circadian clock will be in the wrong time zone. So that was a big, uh, one of the big confounder. We found that a lot of pe normal people, if they're shift worker, they get SOREM during the MSLT. And then some others get it by luck. I mean, we don't know because if you repeat it again, it doesn't change anything. It's also a little bit related to sleep deprivation. If people are chronically sleep deprived, they have more tendency of having SOREM. But in general, there's definitely a group of false positive uh, people who are kind of normal and have a positive MSLT, we, even without complaining of anything. And finally, I mean, as I mentioned, people realized more recently that the MSLT with SOREM, the narcolepsy without cataplexy, is really not a stable phenotype. If you take people who have a positive MSLT and a SOREM and sleepiness and no cataplexy, and if you repeat it, only about 10% repeats. So most of the cases, they switch to idiopathic hypersomnia, or vice versa. So again, idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy without cataplexy, I'm repeating myself, it shouldn't be differentiated. We just don't have any evidence that it's different based on the MSLT. Now, that doesn't mean that it's, there is not different types of narcolepsy without cataplexy and idiopathic hypersomnia, but it's just that the MSLT is the wrong way to differentiate people who are tired, you know. We, we have people who are very tired, and some report that they have long sleep episodes. Some people, they feel refreshed after a nap. Maybe that's much more important than the MSLT. That's what I wanted to say. So in conclusion, narcolepsy without cataplexy is not a reliable uh, diagnosis, and this has been confirmed by many people based on the MSLT. So, one of the first questions you may ask me, which is totally reasonable, is now we know that idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy without cataplexy should not be differentiated. So does it matter? I mean, maybe we don't care. Maybe they react to the same treatment. And indeed, there is a strong uh, point with it, because, for example, if you use Zyram now, we have, we have used a lot Zyram in patients with idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy without cataplexy. And, and it seems that it, it helps a subset of patients, whether or not you have idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy without cataplexy. I haven't found a difference. So uh, 
definitely the MSLT shouldn't be the predictor for trying to select a drug. That's what I want to point out. Um, and then, uh, you know, probably both narcolepsy without cataplexy and idiopathic hypersomnia, they might be a circuit in phase problem with this REM sleep occurrence. We don't know, it hasn't been studied. And then in some cases, definitely, there is some overlap with psychiatric issues. Uh, but the problem is psychiatric issues are so common, you know, like 15% of the population has anxiety or depression. So, you know, what does it mean? We, you find it often associated and it overlaps with it. But, you know, maybe it's connected, maybe it's not. But certainly uh, uh, that's, uh, um, that's one, one uh, important aspect. And again, I, I mentioned that for idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy type 2, we don't know the long-term prognosis. There have been very few studies that have looked at people who were diagnosed, and then 10 years later, are they off medication, are they doing well, or do they still have the problem? Uh, and as I mentioned, people who have looked at it, it seems that probably about half improve with time. So it's very important to remember that. So now you, we killed the MSLT, so the next question is, it is very nice, but <laughs> what do we do then? You know, whoop. Uh, so what do we do? So one of the things is, you know, some people try to cluster. You know, you look at patients and you say, do patient cluster in certain groups? And unfortunately, some people try to cluster, but with the MSLT. And they kind of got some symptom and PSG clusters, but honestly, I, I don't know what you all think, but I didn't think that was very convincing. They found like seven clusters, and, but I mean, it was a bit difficult to really make sense of what they found. And I think the main problem was really because they were adding the MSLT into the mix. I think we really need to cluster more by, uh, by not with the sleep uh, MSLT, but maybe more with the nocturnal sleep or with uh, sleep during the day. And indeed, uh, even for nocturnal sleep, People haven't found big differences between narcolepsy without cataplexy and idiopathic hypersomnia. So I think we need some new methods to differentiate, because now we have idiopathic hypersomnia and, and narcolepsy without cataplexy. And by the way, it's really annoying, because in all my write-ups, I always write narcolepsy without cataplexy slash idiopathic hypersomnia. And this way, I try to get the reimbursement of narcolepsy without cataplexy. And then, you know, so that I can get whatever drugs. I, I mean, and uh, even if the MSLT, I don't care. And then if someone complains, I haven't been caught yet, I will say, look at all this paper. It means nothing. So that's why I call them the same way. But uh, hopefully, I will win that battle if it happened. But the insurance company, thankfully, their IQ is very low. So they are very <laughs> <laughs> So they don't. Uh, it's, that's the only place where I think artificial intelligence should quickly replace them. But, <laughs> uh, but I, I think definitely it's going to be, uh, we have to redefine it. And we have to redefine it in something that matters more. So we want to really see what people experience during the day. Because night, okay, it's important, but that's not necessarily the, the problem. The problem with idiopathic hypersomnia and, and narcolepsy with that cataplexy is during the day. People feel they are foggy, or people feel they have to take these naps. They may feel better after a nap. They feel worse after a nap. This is a real phenotype of the patients that we see, and that's what we have to treat. And that's why I think we have to switch from studying night sleep uh, and the MSLT to studying during the whole day. And I think there's definitely new devices now that are being developed where you can do EEG during the entire day. And what this was is done in actually Europe, they do that, they measure uh, sleep and wake uh, with EEG all during the day. But the problem is often they force people, like in Montpellier, they force people to lay down in a bed and do nothing, and they just see if the people fall asleep. I don't think it's a natural setup. And the one in Italy, they do slightly better. They try to uh, use the PSG, you know, measure the sleep, but people can walk around or do whatever they want, and then they try to see what happened. I think the future, ideally, would be if you could wear like an helmet, and then you could walk around, do whatever you want, cook, etc., and we will record your sleep and your EG pattern during the entire day and entire night, so we'll see, oh, do people go into microsleep? Do they have periods of time where they have, they looks like sleep, but they are awake? Or do people take very long naps? 
Or even it's possible that some of these people who uh, report brain fog, a lot of patients report like being not there. You know, if you look at the EEG, it might be abnormal, but without really sleeping. But nobody has really studied that. So I think a lot of people now realize that what we need is shift the focus from looking at sleep at night to looking at wake during the day. What, can we find something that looks like uh, foggy, you know, being foggy? Can we look at something like falling asleep, et cetera? Do you go into REM sleep? And it's clear that that's where I am going and like everybody else is going. But in addition, this is okay because you can maybe describe how people feel better and try better uh, uh, accuracy of the same tone in terms of the recording. But we also want to go to the cause of the problem. And for that, I think doing some biological tests like genetic and proteomics could be very helpful. Uh, in particular, I believe that a lot of patients that are tired uh, are sometimes, uh, we don't know if they are tired because their circadian clock is abnormal. Some of these patients with idiopathic hypersomnia, I'm sure some of you, uh, you have a lot of difficulties waking up in the morning. That's one of the classic idiopathic hypersomnia. But one of the problems that, this problem is also found in people who have delayed sleep phase syndrome. Like you all know that adolescents, you know, when you, when you are younger and you go to bed at two, you can't go to bed before 2 a.m. and then you can't wake up at 7 a.m. You're just like a zombie. So it looks a little bit like idiopathic hypersomnia for that symptom. And imagine that maybe some people with idiopathic hypersomnia, they, maybe it's one of their problems, that their circadian clock is completely abnormal, so they try to wake up in the middle of their real night, and that's why they feel so bad, and in addition, they sleep during the day. So if, if the cause of these patients is partially circadian, we should definitely try to treat them differently from other people, in particular with light or even with this new melatonin compounds that are very powerful to maybe reset the circadian clock. So that's why I, I, the other things that I feel we have to do is to use some more biologically based uh, you know, test to try to understand a little bit better different uh, subtype of, narcolepsy, of uh, idiopathic hypersomnia that could be either due to, to not having enough sleep or having the wrong circadian phase, being living in Tokyo time, or a combination of both, or not having enough wake promotion. Do we need to help people to sleep better with RM, or do we need to wake them up with stimulants? So this kind of things could really help us to, to better uh, you know, uh, classify and treat these patients. And one that's, uh, uh, you know, so there's a lot of progress in artificial intelligence that are making the way we record sleep much more efficient. For example, this new program that was developed by uh, Matthias, uh, uh, who is a very bright co computer scientist, uh, can score sleep within like half a second. So it can tell you, I'm, exagger I'm simplifying, but it can tell you you are in REM sleep with, during that half second, you know, for very high resolution, instead of using every uh, 30 seconds. So for example, now we can try to see if there is increase like REM sleep event in the middle of the day for one second. And maybe that's much more predictive of narcolepsy type 1 or certain type of narcolepsy type 2 or certain type of idiopathic hypersomnia. And we are looking at this kind of things during the day, but this is really preliminary. But what I'm doing now is I'm, you all know I've been through this MSLT, so I'm trying to use the data. Unfortunately, I would like to have people wear these helmets and have sleep during the day and the night for hundreds of people with idiopathic hypersomnia and analyze that, but I don't have it. So what do we do? We use what we have, which is the MSLT. And the MSLT, normally you take these naps, but in between the nap, they ask people to try to stay awake. So we are, we are extracting you now these periods of wakefulness between the naps. And then we are trying to see if it looks different between different subtypes of idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy without cataplexy. So right now we started by just looking at microsleep. You know, like, do people kind of fall asleep for a very brief period of time? Like, you know, nod off in between these naps where they're supposed to stay awake. And indeed, we're finding that uh, some people do and other people don't. I think that will be a much more objective way of separating different types of hypersomnia. But this is just the beginning. So I think, again, I, I, I think our next step for this area is to define what is being awake, you know? That's really key for me. Like people with idiopathic hypersomnia, they tell you they are tired, but it's very different from one person to the next. Some people, they can't resist sleep, they fall asleep. 
Others, they tell you they are just like never really awake, but it's not like they fall asleep. So we really need to differentiate maybe these patterns and maybe find some things that predict this. So the ideal case would be to have patients with idiopathic hypersomnia report, oh, I'm very foggy, or oh, I did fall asleep, etc., and correlates what people report with the EG, and then maybe find some ways of predicting this objectively with the EG. Then we'll have a biological basis for the problem that could really be used as a diagnostic test. And uh, I'm hoping that this will be the kind of things we need to do. But unfortunately, we don't have the data yet. And I think that's the biggest problem. What we need is to really ha have a lot of people wear EEG during the daytime and annotate how they feel during the daytime. And that's a future, in my opinion. But unfortunately, it's going to take a few years to be able to have that kind of data. The second thing is maybe we don't need the EEG. You know, after all, like using the EEG, it's very uh, uncomfortable. Uh, even so, I, as I told you, it's, it's really becoming much better now. There's this kind of helmets that you can wear, that you could wear for 24 hours or 48 hours, but it's still, maybe it's not necessary. And you all know what an actigraph is, you know. For example, the iPhone, the, 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 the Apple Watch, they have an actigraph. There is uh, Fitbit, all those, they all have actigraph. Basically, they measure movements at a high frequency. And maybe it would be enough, you know, we don't know. We just have to test with actigraphy. Can we differentiate people with idiopathic sub hypersomnia in subgroups? So I think this still needs to be done. And for example, even for narcolepsy type 1, people have done some work that seems to show that even with low resolution, like 30 second epoch, which is not very good, now we can measure activity every second, we can, it can differentiate narcolepsy type 1 from other hypersomnia. But I think we did a lot to do a lot more with better devices and in idiopathic hypersomnia, narcolepsy without cataplexy to try to find different patterns, you know. Um, and with that, I mean, in my opinion, I'm always coming back to genetics because genetics is a cause of problems and it's often, uh, uh, you know, a completely different way to look at things. And what, what's very clear from all these experiments is when you really only use sleep or only use one modality or actigraphy, sometimes these programs, they work, but they always make mistakes because you cannot foresee everything. For example, we have very good program now that can look at sleep at night and can predict narcolepsy with as good as the MSLT, like 95%, et cetera. But if the person doesn't sleep at all, what do you do? So that's a problem. You may still have narcolepsy. You can't observe anything. And it's very complicated. There's always exceptions. There's always cases that don't fit. So that makes it a problem, because if you want to screen for narcolepsy in the general population, for example, you really want to make sure that you have 100% specificity, that it can pick up even rare cases. And that's why it looks more and more apparent than to have the best performance for all this program is to mix up different types of data. So one will be sleep or actigraphy, which will measure certain things, but add the genetic or add proteomics, as I will argue. And the combination of these different markers that are totally different will make much more better prediction because it's, it doesn't make the same type of mistakes, you know, and that's why it's so powerful. So genetics is one of the way. And by the way, uh, we know that people, that's one of the surprises that has been found, that people who report sleeping too much or needing too much sleep there often is a slight correlation with the genetic risk factors of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. We don't really know why, but there's a little bit of overlap between the genes that predispose with, to long sleep and, and, and the genes that predispose to, to uh, uh, this kind of problem. And as I, uh, of course, if we could have like a genome studies of idiopathic hypersomnia, maybe we'll find genes that will, you know, as a, as a total can predict and help to predict these problems. Um, and uh, one, uh, one thing that I feel very strongly about is finally trying to use proteomics. So maybe that's a little bit technical for you, but the genetic is you are born with it. It predicts things, but never very strongly. You know, it's not like 100%. You know, we are all born with genes, but it depends what we do with it. You know, I mean, depending on our environment, etc. A lot of people are born predisposed to narcolepsy type 1, but only a very small percent develop narcolepsy because it depends on what kind of flu you got, what kind of things you experience on, during your entire life. And I think it's the same for most disorders. The genetics will never tell you, oh, 
that's it, you have narcolepsy or you have idiopathic hypersomnia. It could tell you you are more at risk of, and, and I think because it's a completely different type of information, it will complete and improve prediction when you use that plus actigraphy and plus what people experience. And proteomics is a little bit closer to physiology because the gene produces proteins, but the proteins are also a change with the environment. So for example, you know, circadian rhythm, we can now predict circadian rhythm by measuring all these proteins, and some protein rises at different times of the day, and then if, if they rise at the wrong time of the day, you can tell if the circadian rhythm is completely abnormal. So that's what we are doing now. We're measuring like 5,000 different proteins in the blood, which in one little drop of blood, and then some of these proteins, they increase in the early morning, others they increase in the middle morning, others they increase around lunchtime, some others increase in the middle of the night, and then by looking at all these proteins and where they are, we can kind of have an idea. If we take a blood sample and we note it's 8 p.m., and then we test it and say, oh, no, not at all. It says it's 12 p.m. So in that case, you know, we can know that the circadian phase is abnormal of four hours, you know, uh, because this protein profile tell us. And we are also trying to find a group of proteins that reflects the fact that people sleep too much or groups of proteins that people are sleep deprived. And my, my dream, you know, would be to use that plus the genetic, plus something that measures sleep during the day. Then we'll know if people have micro sleep, how they sleep during the day, how they sleep during the night. We'll know what are the genetic factors that predispose to idiopathic hypersomnia, different types, what, how the protein are changing, so that we will know if these people live in Tokyo time or in, I don't know where I use Tokyo, but I should use Paris time. <laughs> <laughs> Paris time, or in Tokyo time, or in the normal time, we could see if the protein profile kind of suggests that they don't have enough sleep. In that case, we will give probably more Xyrem, or not enough wake, and in that case, maybe you want to give an orexin agonist or a stimulant, and I think that will really help to, to treat patients better. Uh, I'm going to pass this. I think it's just a general idea. And just to mention uh, where maybe we have been moving a little bit more, of course, there is narcolepsy, but also Klein-Levin syndrome. We did quite a bit of work on Klein-Levin syndrome. Um, I mean, I think I need now to work a little bit more on idiopathic hypersomnia. But uh, the, the reason uh, I work on periodic hypersomnia is that it has been defined uh, very well since the 1920s. Nobody contests the disease, you know. Nobody fights, oh, it's the MSLT, not the MSLT. It has a clear definition. And we know it's a very severe disorder. Like people suddenly, for two weeks, they look like idiopathic hypersomnia multiplied by 100. You know, they are just like completely in a fog. They can't even talk. They just are very abnormal. It's very, very strong phenotype. And it's very odd because it goes on and off. So, and when you do even like scanning of the brain uh, activity during hypersomnia, when they, they are very tired, their brain uh, cortex seems to be disconnected, which may explain why they have a lot of problems responding to questions, et cetera, because it's so strong that, that some parts of the brain don't seem to work normally. And you can detect it by doing scans of looking at the activity of the brain when you have an episode or not. And then we did a genetic study and it took a long time, there's a lot of authors, as you see, uh, to take blood sample from tons. You all know that I'm an international vam vampire, uh, and I always get you know, blood sample from anyone, but it's for a good cause, and it's to do the genetics and this proteomics. And for example, when we did a genetic scan of, of, uh, of, of the people with um, uh, Klein-Levin syndrome, we found that one of the top gene that was found was also involved in bipolar disorder, which is interesting because it also reacts to lithium. So I suspect that there is probably some forms of hypersomnia that have overlap with this kind of pathology. And by the way, the, there were not only this strong gene, but what was very interesting is that uh, it, it, it also repeated very well. So if you take one patient, you know, one gene is good, but what you want to also do is a combination of genetic factors. So for example, when we took the first 500 patients with Klein-Levin syndrome, we could calculate like a polygenic score. We could find all the genes that are associated with it, but maybe not at a very high level. And when we tested a series of 200 patients after that, it was also quite predictive, so it repeated. So the idea here is not to look for one gene, 
but maybe a combination of many genes that can predict you know, the risk of, of the disease. Uh, and the proteomics, the same way, by measuring 5,000 proteins, we could actually diagnose patients with KLS relatively well. I mean, we need to definitely uh, reproduce that, but I was really surprised myself. It looks like in the blood, even when people are not in episodes, we could find a, a signature of like 20 or 30 proteins that were elevated or decreased in patients with Klein Levin that seems to predict relatively well is that Klein Levin or not. And it was reproduced and we found it both in the blood and the CSF, which comes from the brain, which makes me think that it's probably a true uh, uh, finding. So now I really want to do that in idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy without cataplexy, because my dream would be to really be able to combine all these different modality. You know, I, again, my point is that if we use only sleep, we'll miss something. But if we use sleep and genetic and proteomics, I think at the end we'll become much more specific and be able to really understand different subtype of people who have sleep problems. So in my opinion, what needs to be done in our age is we definitely need to study more sleep and wake. And for this, we need to use uh, you know, deep learning and new statistical models to, pre to predict brain fog, to predict uh, macro sleep, to predict different types of wakefulness and different types of sleep. And I think we need to do it at home. You know, like people need to wear something at home for 24, 48 hours, and then we can really see what's happening objectively during the day. Are they sleeping? Are they not sleeping, etc.? I think we need to definitely look at the genetic for idiopathic hypersomnia. It's really too bad because it hasn't been done, uh, and it would be easy because there's so many patients. Uh, but even just a GWAS, I think, would be very informative. Uh, and then I, I really, I'm a big believer in this proteomics, that by measuring these proteins, we can find if people have an abnormal circadian clock, if people have sleep deprived, so they need to sleep more, or if they have insufficient sleep or wake promoting mechanism. Uh, and I, I think that's another uh, promising way to separate different types of hypersomnia. And uh, we, I hope to be doing that in the future. And, and really, nef definitely, at the end, maybe we'll differentiate different subtypes of idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy without cataplexy. They won't be based on the MSLT, I'm sure. Uh, in my opinion, they would be based much more on symptoms, you know, like people who just sleep a lot even during the day, people who have brain fog but don't sleep, people who have micro sleep, but we'll see. And then, uh, event, of course, what will be important is treatment response, because we don't care if they all work with the same drug or work. But I suspect that if we define biologically different disorder, we'll see much more clearly. Like for Xyrem, for example, I mean, some of you idiopathic hypersomnia, it's amazing. I mean, some of these patients react super well to Xyrem, they do very well. But for others, it doesn't work at all. And we don't, I, I personally haven't found a clue why Xyrem works in some idiopathic hypersomnia and not others. And maybe by doing this subtyping, we might be able to better tailor the type of treatment to each type of idiopathic hypersomnia. So that's, uh, that's my dream. And uh, I just want to point out that this is the main people who have been working with me uh, in the lab, uh, Cathy Sederberg, G German Kolosov, and Adrian Specht for not only the proteomics, uh, Aditya Hambati for the genetics. And a lot of the work about this circadian proteomics is done in collaboration with Harvard in particular, uh, Gene Duffy and Chuck. And for narcolepsy and all these samples, often I work with the entire world. And I just want to mention uh, Isabelle Arnuf who works a lot of KLS, and Giuseppe Platzi and Yves Dovillier works a lot on narcolepsy. And uh, finally, I want to mention I work also with people in Takeda uh, because uh, they are, you know, head with this orexin agonist and, and Dimitri Volson and other, uh, we now are good colleagues and we try to, they have, they have more resources than me, so I guess <laughs> I work with uh, whoever has, and, and I think they're very interested in detecting narcolepsy and some, some of these disorders for their drugs, so uh, I, I have some collaboration going on with them. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. We actually have time for one question. And uh, while the KLS panel come and get mic'd up, so one question only, I'm afraid. Who's going to have it? Question. Okay, right your hand question. was first. <laughs> That's a lot of power. <laughs> <laughs> I 
better be good. <laughs> I think it's a question that everybody's got on their minds. You're, oh, uh, you're, you're talking about a complete paradigm shift. You're talking about taking the present system, tearing it down, and building something else up. What else, or excuse me, how long is this going to take for all of us? Ah. Yeah, it's going to take a while. Uh, unfortunately, you know, is, is what Bachelor called the epistemological obstacle. You know, it's very difficult to change some things that are drained. Uh, it really takes sometimes a generation. I'm, I don't think it will take a generation because everything is accelerated. Uh, but I think it, it will take five, or five years if we are very optimistic, probably 10 years until we are there. Um, I, I wish it would go faster, but uh, it's very difficult. There is like vested investment, you know, like all these people make money with the MSLT. There is no reimbursement. There is a drug, co there is a, the uh, insurance companies that want to make sure that they continue to build this and not this. They don't want to pay. So it's just, unfortunately, logic is not always a top priority. <laughs> mm. we, we all know that, but, but it will eventually prevail. Mm. We just have to push, and, and your mm. voice, by the way, is one of the ways you can push, you know? You have to really uh, make your voice heard mm -hmm. and say that this situation has to change, and mm -hmm. in particular, I really believe that idiopathic hypersomnia has to be considered a real disease, not like a, like a an, you know, like a set, after thought, oh, you don't have narcolepsy without cataplexy, you don't, yep, you have idiopathic hypersomnia. Mm. Yeah, am I right in thinking that you're actually not going to retire? <laughs> well, I don't know. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we do have time for one more quick question while they get ready. Andrew. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd like to just follow up, actually, on what, what you were saying, Claire, and what, what, what mm -hmm. you were saying, um, Dr. Mignot. What can we in this room do to shorten that timeline? Um, should we, for instance, all be doing 23andMe? Does that help you with any of your um, research? Should we be wearing Actigraph wristbands so that we can get you more data? Um, how can we help you? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, certainly, I think participating in research is, is, is definitely one of the best way, whether it's my research or the research of someone else. And I, I think that really makes a big difference. I would say that it's also important to be a tiny bit politically active in terms of making sure that this, these orders are not forgotten by NIH and all the people who try to fund research. Um, and then even lobbying, you know, like the ESM and some of those, uh, uh, you know, conventions so that they change the system faster. I mean, for me, uh, you know, like I call that death by committee. I mean, as soon as you put like 20 people together, they start to argue forever. And then at the beginning, they say, we are going to change everything. And then at the end, oh, yes, now we are going to change the way we define sleep latency. Instead of taking like two epochs of non-REM and whatever, it will be only the first epoch of N2. Victory! And then just like you have spent six months discussing together and you end up with a very mediocre result. I'm not sure how we can change that because that's inherent to some of the uh, group thinking. Uh, but I think, for example, in the context of idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy without cataplexy, I think there is a good impetus to change that. But we also are very afraid because, you know, Karen and I, I'm sure we agree. But then if we change it, and then the insurance company to say, oh, that's great. Now we don't even pay for narcolepsy without cataplexy, you know? So I can't really, you can do the right thing scientifically, but be shot in the foot by, you know, by the insurance company. So I, unfortunately, the best you can do, I think at least I cannot advise you what to do for this bigger uh, area. So for sure, working on the ICD-4 will be very important. But I think um, uh, the research at the end will triumph. If there is enough data that shows that this is exactly the way that, that, that it should be done, it will work. Um, I'm not really answering your question. I wish I could. But if you want to give your blood sample, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I, I'm sure we've got people waiting at the door, ready no, no. to uh, but, to but, take everyone's but samples. But I think it's uh, <laughs> it's a very uh, we'll make we'll make more pro and also I think another thing that's definitely underestimated is I believe in single individual making a big difference, and I think we don't have enough people and you know that are trained and interested in this area. I think you know having younger students and people who really have a future in this area of idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy without cataplexy is critical. I really feel we don't have enough people mm. uh, doing this kind of research. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, funding fellowship or things like that, I think can make a big difference. Mm. Thank you very much.